Hi, this is Roger in Finland, and today we're going to be talking about the Zcam E2C H265 versus ProRes. Before talking to the impatient ones, the usual disclaimer, especially when I'm talking about cameras like this one, which is a cinema camera. I don't really know what I'm doing, I'm just a hobbyist, I'm just an amateur, I have fun with these things, and I share what I have learned and I might make some mistakes, so please bear with me. So for the impatient ones, this H.265 versus ProRes, it doesn't pertain only to the E2C, but that's the camera that I have right now that it shoots H.265 into the SD card, and ProRes if you have a external hard drive attached to it by the via USB-C. So that's what I'm gonna be comparing. And in general, if you need or want 422, then you're gonna need to shoot in ProRes, the flavors of ProRes that have 422, both of them, ProRes and H.265, are 10-bit when it comes to color depth. And the question is, when would you want to use 422? And one case that comes to my mind is if you're doing green screening or compositing. Another possible reason to choose ProRes over H.265 is your editing machine. They're fixing my roof, so somebody's walking up there. That's a bit spooky. ProRes will be easier and smoother to edit in general than H.265, so that's something to consider. The biggest advantage of H.265 is that it's much, much smaller in file size. So there you go. But now let's go into some more details. The E2C, this tiny, magical, fantastic cinema camera, can record H.265 internally into the SD card, then can record ProRes, different flavors, Proxy, LTE, 422HQ, into an SSD via USB-C connection, and then you can record ProRes RAW into a Tomos Ninja 5. I do have the Ninja 5, but I don't have any possibility to put ProRes RAW into my workflow, so that's not a use case that I will be exploring anytime soon, or anytime. Then, obviously the main difference between the two codecs is that H.265 is 420, 10 bits, while ProRes is 422, 10-bit. So you do have better chroma sack sampling. We're gonna go in a moment to explain what does that mean in practice. The biggest advantage of the H.265 I mentioned for the impatient ones is the file size. And here, now that I have just plugged the one terabyte SSD into the Zcam, I can record a little bit less than 10 hours with just 265 into it, and a little bit less than four hours with ProRes 422. Not the LT, not the HQ, but just ProRes 422. And that's a significant difference. So if you're here and maybe thinking about this camera, it might be that you're a bit like me, a hobbyist and has some interest in the topic but don't know exactly what chromosome sampling is. So let me try to explain it a little bit as easy as I can for what I understood the topic. 422 and 420 are different values of chroma subsampling and this means in practice that the more the number, the more able is the camera in that particular code to distinguish colors between pixels. Basically, 420 will be using neighboring pixels to decide what's the color of this particular one, and 422 will still do that, but much less. The way to get away so that each pixel decides on its own color will be 444, and that's why we have the flavor of ProRes 4444, but I don't think that the Zcam can shoot in ProRes 4444. It might be that ProRes RAW would go into that direction. I don't know, I'm not gonna get there, and now it just sounded like Moses Malone, but that's okay. Again, when would you want to be more precise in distinguishing what color do you have in different pixels? Think about the green screen. Good green screen has no edges, and by green screening, you can see the green edges. And the reason for that is that the camera is not able to distinguish the pixels with such precision if the chroma sampling is not good enough. That would be a reason to choose a codec that can take 422 over 420. Then there is the bit depth here. Both codecs actually have 10 bits, so there's no difference. You can still shoot H.264 with a Zcam, which has 8 bits, and that would be a different thing. And that means color depth, which in practice is how many different colors can it distinguish from each other. Having less bits or less color depth might result into banding, because it kind of jumps from one color to the other, in the case of a blue sky, for instance, and having more colors like 10 bit, that problem is smaller. And then if you get 12-bit ProRes RAW, even less. And if you go further, even less. I think I have explained these things maybe a little bit better in a previous video talking about the different video modes for the Panasonic G9. So I'm gonna put the link down below and somewhere here, and you can check that out as well. And another thing to consider about these codecs 
and this is not a scientific explanation, it's just some learning, and it's not exactly black and white in all the cases, is distinguishing between acquisition, intermediate, and delivery. In basic terms, acquisition is what the camera acquires, intermediate is what you work with, and delivery is the final result, kind of the output of your render. If you think about it in very simplistic terms, a camera would shoot raw footage, which is huge and difficult to work with, but has all the information you want, that's acquisition. Then you have some intermediate format that allows you to work with it. It's easy to edit. You still have a lot of information for color grading, but it's not as heavy as raw. And then when you deliver, you apply all of your editing and all of your manipulation into the raw image and then do a delivery, which is gonna have a lot less information, but it doesn't matter because that information is just final. You don't need it anymore to work with. So that's a nice theory, but what happens in reality? Most consumer cameras acquire in delivery formats. So many cameras acquire actually using H.264. Think about most Sony mirrorless cameras and Panasonic's and whatnot. It's getting better. Some cameras have more possibilities even to record through an external recorder like an Atomos Ninja 5, and then you get uh, DNA HQ or ProRes, given that the camera gives good color information through the HDMI output, but still many of these cameras internally just record in delivery formats. That means that they're not really thought out to record and then really work on the image. It's not impossible, but it's not ideal. And a reason that delivery formats are difficult to create and difficult to edit is that first, they have less information. Less information means that you cannot push things beyond the boundaries. And second one is that they are compressed, so they tend to be so that every frame needs information from before and after to decide what's in there. And that's fine if you're just playing back, because it buffers a little bit and it goes ahead, but if you need to edit or work with something, every time you jump within a clip, the computer needs to work and figure out, well, I don't know what this frame is, so I need to figure out based on what I know from before and after, and that's what takes computation time and that makes it a bit difficult to edit. Then nowadays we have cameras like this one or the Pocket 4K, or as I said before, mirrorless cameras through um, external recorders that allow you to acquire in what traditionally they are considered intermediate codecs, like ProRes. ProRes, mostly, and most of the flavors are designed for and thought for being an intermediate codec, meaning one which is very good for manipulating. But because many consumer cameras acquire in delivery codecs, Acquiring in intermediate, it's still better than acquiring in delivery. So now what I'm doing right now, for instance, this video is being recorded in an intermediate codec, which is ProRes 422. But for my standards, there's way more information that I would ever need. And I will use the acquisition intermediate codec as intermediate. And then I will deliver in H.264 for just publishing in YouTube. And then if we can see that RAW is more of an acquisition codec than an intermediate one, we start to have acquisition codecs that are very good as intermediate codecs, like Blackmagic B-RAW. It's a compressed, non-lossless RAW format, but if you just edit it in DaVinci Resolve, it's super quick and smooth to edit, and it behaves like an intermediate codec, even if it's an acquisition one. And that's what I meant when I said that these things are not exactly black and white. It's RAW is this, intermediate is that, it's how we decide to work with, especially people like me that we don't know what we're doing and talking about. So please keep that in mind before adding nasty comments. So going back to the E2C, H265 should be worse for grading, worse for editing than ProRes. Why would I use it? Well, it's actually surprisingly good. It's very easy to grade for the need that I have, which is very low. And I'm pretty sure that many people are in a similar situation. This H265 with either flat profile, which is the one that I like, or with G-Lock if you prefer that one, you're gonna be able to grade it just fantastically fine. And when it comes to editing, it's fairly okay. In my case, my computer that I use for editing purposes, it's a, a gaming laptop. It's an HP Omen 15 from 2018. The processor is an i8750, 16 gigabits of RAM, gigabits, gigabits? 16 gigabytes of RAM. The graphics card is a 1070 Max-Q. I did swap the hard drive for an two terabyte Samsung SSD, which is way faster than the mechanical thing that it came with. And then I have a 266 gigs NVMe for the system and running the programs. I said it's two years old and it edits fantastically fine. Bureau, for instance, or ProRes, but 
editing H.265 is also very, very smooth. So that was a nice surprise. However, I already found one use case that I do use where H.265 makes my life difficult. And that's if I'm stacking several clips on top of another. So when would I do that? Well, in the couple of videos that I've released recently, links down below and somewhere up here, about the picture of profiles and the surprisingly good ISO, high ISO performance on this camera, I was putting four clips next to each other for comparison's sake which means that on my timeline they're on top of each other. When that happens, my computer can't play that back. I'm gonna show it to you guys. And in a camera like this, they should not look good at all. Oh, that's what was my expectation. Rex had ISO 6400, same, but you can see that when I'm doing that, H265 is painful. If I don't need to stack, clips on top of another. H265 is super nice because the files are smaller, they're as easy to edit, and they're as nice to create. So for those cases, better for me than ProRes. But if I need to do stacking, then I would have to use ProRes. ProRes. But if I need to do stacking, then I would have to use ProRes. And that would be my conclusion. When will I be using H.265 and when ProRes? Most of the time H.265 because A, I can record to the SD card, so I don't need to arrange any special setup, putting a hard drive around the camera, and then second the file size. In the case that I know that I'm gonna be stacking clips on top of another, and if I'm special, I'm shooting in a situation like this where everything is on the table so I can just mount things and I don't need to worry about carrying it around, then ProRes is the option I will choose. Now the question is, what do you use if you have a need to see camera? Are you using ProRes or are you happy with H.265 and why? I would be interested to know. I hope you liked the video. If you did, please like and subscribe and we're gonna see you soon for some more content.